Great. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Casey Garrison, and I'll just be doing a bit of an intro here to our fourth social work in um, libraries online simulation hub public lecture series. Uh, so first, I'd like to just start with the acknowledgement of countries. As members of the CSU community, we acknowledge the words of the Rajri people on whose land our university was founded and share their aspiration of Yindya Maro and Nanana. They aim for us all to learn the wisdom of respectfully living well in a land worth living in. We pay our respect to the traditional custodians of these lands where we live and work, and I extend that respect to any First Nations people present here today or listening later. I'm coming to you from Gadigal and Birbirgal country today. Proud of that. So feel free to pop into the chat where you're coming from. Um, yes, so just an introduction to our project. So the online, the SWIL Online Simulation Hub Facilitating Industry Engagement Project aims to promote partnerships with public libraries by bringing social work to communities at the grassroots level, promoting co-design research and enhancing pedagogy for social work and information studies students. And it has been founded through the Australian government's National Priorities and Industry Link Fund. So as part of this project, um, leader Sabine Wardle and myself, we are hosting this public lecture series and have been really lucky to have some great um, speakers like our speaker today. Um, and just a bit of housekeeping, everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those after Leanne's presentation, uh, but feel free to pop things into the chat as well as we go along. Um, and yes, yeah, so with that, I would like to introduce um, our fourth speaker in our series, Leanne Mitchell. So Leanne's work and study over the last two decades in government, the United Nations and the non-for-profit sector has allowed her to examine homelessness in many different forms. In 2018, she was part of the team that established the City of Melbourne's Library Social Work Program, and in 2022 undertook a Churchill Fellowship traveling to the UK, US, and Canada, investigating how local government can respond to homelessness while balancing responsibilities to the wider community. During those travels, she visited a selection of public libraries on the east and west coast of the USA that are running social work programs. Her report, Everybody's Business, What Local Government Can Do to End Homelessness, has established a new body of knowledge that is being put to practical use in Australia and shared with colleagues and collaborators around the world. So with that, Leanne, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much. Casey, for the introduction. So I'm going to start sharing a screen and um, I'm not sure whether I, if I got the right screen there. Can you see it? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So um, thanks, everyone. It's great to he be here. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where I live here in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge the lasting impacts that colonisations had on our First Nations people. And I really note with sorrow the rates of homelessness experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is five times higher than the rest of our population. This beautiful work that you can see a picture of now features Bunjil, who's the creator and protector of the Wurundjeri people. And this image is in the Brimbank Community and Civic Centre where I work. It's on the window of the council chamber. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Brimbank City Council for supporting me in doing this work and also the Winston Churchill Trust and the Jack Brockhoff Foundation for allowing me the opportunity to complete a Churchill Fellowship. And of course, thank you to my colleagues at Charles Sturt University for making today possible. It is really great to be here. So the story I'm going to tell you starts here. And I took this photo in 2016. This is a spot under a rail bridge, not far from Flinders Street Station in downtown Melbourne. And in that summer, the number of unhoused people sleeping on the streets in inner city Melbourne grew rapidly. It was highly vis visible and literally happened over the period of a few weeks. It was a marked change and quite confronting for many. And quite likely, it was the result of a perfect storm building over, that was building over many years. It included rising housing prices, rent increases, 
places of last resort closing, lower investment in public housing, changes to the mental health system. And not long after, a local paper started running a campaign to clean up the city. And this led to a lot of community outrage and people started looking at the council to do something and we were really inundated with complaints. The next summer, a group of people camped outside the Flinders Street Station, and this was in January 2017, at the time of the Australian Open. And the complaints raised as people ran, as the papers ran more stories. So they were villainising people living on the streets, criticising the Lord Mayor, the Premier and the Police Chief for not taking action, and also shaming the, the city for the state it was in when, an in when international tourists were about to arrive for a major sporting event. And under a lot of political and community and media pressure, Melbourne's council at the time sought to update the local street laws to change how people could reside on inner city streets. So they, were, they proposed to broaden a ban on camping, allow the confiscation of excess goods and introduce fines. Now, thankfully, the result was a strong, was strong public sentiment against the proposed changes and the move was abandoned. But the homelessness issue did split our community into camps. You know, those who wanted to do something for the most marginalised people in our community and those who wanted a safe, clean, accessible city above everything else. And what this experience taught me was that homelessness is a really deeply political issue. And it's about many things, uh, people's welfare, of course, but also about the look and feel of a city, perceptions of safety and a community's identity. I also learned that local government as an entity is not aligned internally when it comes to responding to homelessness. We have many different parts and we do many different things and many different outlooks. And the power of, finally, the power of perception versus fact. So Australian councils really have little power and funds to respond to homelessness, but in the public eye, they often are seen to hold responsibility. I came into this world of libraries and social work a few years after all of that happened in Melbourne through a couple of roles I held with my former employers at the City of Melbourne. Uh, first, I was working in the homelessness team, and then um, I jumped for a short time to manage the department responsible for libraries and um, for libraries in the city. And it was there that I had the opportunity to work some with some really amazing colleagues to establish and trial and then embed a library social work program. And really the light bulb moment that led to the inception of this program was realising that a number of the people that the City of Melbourne's homelessness team was supporting through street outreach were the same as those who our library staff were assisting or sometimes finding challenging in their, in their branches. And when we joined the DOTS, which is not always a first response in busy local government settings, we were able to initiate a piece of joint work that allowed us to better understand the situation we faced and later to employ a permanent social worker in the library. And really the outcomes were eye-opening. Uh, when we experienced the rapidly changing situation on the streets, which I just mentioned a moment ago, our homelessness units unit established a number of responses and that included an in-house assertive outreach team who would work directly with people sleeping on the streets and connect them into appropriate services. And we worked hard to also to build connections with other stakeholders so and partners, police and particularly police and city businesses to help them respond to the crisis. But we really hadn't thought to look further. And what I learned from library staff when I entered their space was that they were in crisis as well. They were really struggling to respond to an increasing number of people with complex needs and they didn't know what to do. It had actually got to a point of high stress and it was becoming an occupational health and safety issue that management were really struggling to address. And uh, after many conversations with library staff and a closer review of the shift notes and incident log logs, what we realised was that actually many of the same people who the city was helping on the streets were also accessing the libraries. But despite working for one organisation, we hadn't really made that connection until that point. 
And what I also came to discover was that library staff often knew many of these people by name and they had built relationships over, year, over years. And coming from a homelessness response perspective, this was just fascinating because I knew that best practice homelessness response is really embedded in relationships and trust. And this was exactly what we were seeing in that our library staff had. And it was right there in one of our own city institutions. The thing was that while some staff felt comfortable working with diverse customers, others were struggling. So the logs that we went through showed that staff were helping people who were demonstrating a variety of complex needs, drug and alcohol dependencies, health and mental health needs, escape, people escaping family violence, people faced with trauma or economic hardships. And when the City of Melbourne's library started noticing changes amongst their users, many raised their concerns because they wanted to do more to help. And on the other hand, there were others who were also feeling um, unsafe in their interactions and wanted more support from their employers. So the response was really mixed. And that's where social work in the library became an option. And uh, one of our library staff members had actually been to San Francisco not long before and had met Leah Squera and her team there. Um, and she saw firsthand the work that they'd been doing in really challenging circumstances. Leah had established what's likely the world's first library social work program, and she was doing really amazing work. And also the State Library of Victoria had also been looking into this and had brought together a few practitioners from the United States to share their learnings. So people were starting to hear about it. And I think that the time was really right for us at that point. Um, this was pre-COVID and connecting via video was a pretty groundbreaking action. So we were pretty proud of ourselves on that front, that we, we were ahead of the curve. And uh, we were able to make contact with Leah in San Francisco and also a team in Denver, Colorado, who were also running these kinds of programs. And we were really fortunate enough to be mentor mentored by them to establish a social work program in our inner city libraries here in Melbourne. And uh, using data to inform how we worked and after conducting a number of staff surveys to measure a baseline, we pulled an outreach worker out of our on-street homelessness assertive outreach team and into the library for a pilot. Uh, to help stabilise the work situation, they first focused on building the knowledge and capacity of staff. So um, they were training staff in trauma-informed practice and bringing in lived experience advocates to teach staff about homelessness. And after that, they started interacting with library users as well. And at the time, while we were doing all of this and trialling it, we collected data, which really helped us assess, improve, and most importantly, make the case to permanently fund the program. So the results were quite astonish astounding, actually. And we soon employed our first qualified library social worker. And through ongoing data collection and surveys, we really saw that the person based in the library was in effect, you know, much more successful in engaging with people with a variety of complex needs. Um, they were also offering brokerage as short-term interventions and helping people start housing applications and referring them into specialist services. And it appeared that people were a lot more open to accept support in a trusted location like a library rather than on the streets where they felt probably unwelcomed and potentially threatened. The power differential was actually so different between the library and the streets, and that was really significant. So it's a few years since I left the city of Melbourne, but that program has been running really successfully for almost five years. And it's really inspired a number of other libraries around the country from Melbourne to Darwin, to Fremantle, to Wagga, to start trialing different ways of responding to homelessness within libraries. And but for me, this was all the start of the journey. And so I'm going to share that with you now. And in doing so and having the opportunity to go overseas and do much more, and I hope that I'm able to sort of uh, show you a few, give you a few pointers and um, help you think a little bit more about how libraries can end homelessness. Okay. Oh, I have frozen. 
Okay, I think I might have just frozen a little bit. Yeah, it looks like you're back on, Leanne. Yeah, am I back? I think I've lost my share though. Yep, yeah, um, we did lose that script. We had it um, for a second and then lost it. So maybe. Oh, okay, I'm having a little bit of problem here because I've actually lost my presentation. presentation. Oh, maybe a PowerPoint restarted yeah. or something. <laughs> it's closed down. Sorry, I'll just have to restart that and see if we can. Uh, I'm not sharing now. Okay. Anymore. Nope. Nope, you just have your camera. A little bit slow though. Is it? Oh, this is a <laughs> this is the problem of tech. We think we're so good at technology, but actually technology has us, doesn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just Casey, I'm just waiting for PowerPoint to open up again. So hopefully that will happen relatively quickly and I'll be back on again. No worries. And yeah, I just really love your um your background there too. It seems is that yeah. can you tell us about that? While we actually, wait? Yeah, we'll be coming to that in a second. That is actually the cover of my uh report. Oh, cool. And, yeah. Um oh, sorry, this is like turned into a bit of an issue for me because I'm not able to open the PowerPoint, but let's see if we can keep going. I'm just gonna stop. Just going to close this sharing down for a second and I shouldn't be too far. I promise you, you might have to do a little song and dance for us while I uh, get this going, Casey. Um, no worries. Actually, I will take the time to just pop into the chat the link to the recordings for all of our lectures we've done so far and then Leanne's recording will be up there as well. And actually in that, um, in the link to Leanne's bio is the report for some, so for some reading later, <laughs> post-lunch read. I think I'm almost there. So give me one moment. I will be able to get to where we were and keep going. No worries. <laughs> yeah, we've not had any major pickups in these lectures yet, so we were Always due. a first, isn't there? <laughs> Always a first. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to get too cocky. We <laughs> <laughs> need to be put back in our place. <laughs> That's right. Keeping us, keeping us all uh, honest. Mm. Okay, I'm almost, um, I think I'm almost there. Thanks. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. Not very far now. Let's, I'm just sharing my, just getting to sharing my screen. Hopefully we can, uh, it'll keep working after this and we don't lose anything. Can you see that now? Casey? It is. It's thinking of it. <laughs> oh, yep. Here we go. We have your the Winston Churchill Trust screen. Okay. You so there might just be a slight delay, maybe. Okay. But... Let's hope that we can keep going here. Okay. So I wanted to know more about what local government could do to end homelessness. And I applied for and was awarded a um, Churchill try oh I've just moved to the wrong slide which doesn't help go okay you can see all the people there right yep yes beautiful um, photos okay. so I applied for a Churchill fellowship um and got that in 2019 COVID got in the way and I finally traveled last year in 2022 um, the Churchill Fellowship allowed me to take a wide look at homelessness responses in local government, and it's an area where a lot of expectation tends to sit um, from the public's perspective, but, but relatively little attention has been paid in Australia. And um, in under, and um, I travelled to the UK, the US and Canada, and you can see on this slide 
some of the amazing and generous people I met along the way. And they work in all levels of government, not for profits, for peak bodies and in the media. And uh, as they are often an arm of local government, I um, included visits to public libraries at four North American locations. So New York, Baltimore, Washington, DC, and San Francisco. And as part of this investigation, I asked my contacts about the roles local government can play in homelessness prevention response and find, found that while there may be a tendency in some places to only view people with homelessness in their job titles or position description as the ones with the capability to make a difference, there are also many great initiatives, partnerships and approaches in place that we can, we can learn from. Through this inquiry, so I collected ideas, tips, stories, and resources about how local government can drive and steer response efforts. And you can access the report through the QR code on the screen, or just go to the Churchill Trust website and have a search for me. If you look through my fellowship report, you will uh, see that I've brought together what I learned um, and heard into a set of guidelines. And these group what I see as potential local government responses to homelessness under four key areas. So the first is knowing your homelessness situation. The second is leading the narrative and driving collaboration. The third is organizing your approach and your workforce. And the fourth is acting wherever you can. As you could imagine, the opportunity to do this work was quite literally for me life-changing. You can see um, on this slide a number of sections in my report that focus on the roles of libraries and um, I invite you to go and have a, have a closer look later on. Um, while I initially approached the problem with quite a narrow perspective, looking at homelessness from a crisis point of view, the rough sleeping end, what I learned pretty quickly is that the role for local government where we can really make a difference probably sits somewhere else. Uh, local government holds a unique position in community where the arm of government closest to the people and by some accounts the most trusted and even though when it comes to homelessness the federal and state governments hold both the responsibility and the funds, communities often look to us to do something about it. It's a role we might not aspire to play, but it is one that we often can't turn down. Um, Capitalising on the position that local government occupies in communities, we have a real opportunity to do things differently. And uh, that is by focusing on prevention, stopping the flow of people into homelessness. One way we can do that is in by engaging and involving the many parts of the council that connect into the community. Those roles that interact with people who know, pe who know people and who might see a problem before it becomes dire. Now, I wonder if that sounds like a group you all might know. Um, I definitely think that this that in this sense our, our libraries have a big role to play along with our local government colleagues like our park rangers, local laws officers, animal welfare officers, street cleaners and customer service. And this approach takes the response away from just the person who has homelessness in their job title or job description and actually makes homelessness everybody's business. It's, a, um, it's collaboration and this is how we know we should address wicked problems like homelessness. So can libraries end homelessness? Well, of course, the answer to that question isn't straightforward. In many of the places I visited last year, especially in the big cities in North America, it felt like there may never be an end to homelessness. But I definitely saw that an important key in reducing and hopefully ending it is through partnerships, genuine and equal partnerships between communities, specialist services and all levels of government. And public libraries, often an important arm of local government, are extremely well positioned as free, welcoming public spaces, locations of learning, information management and community connection, they can play a part in collaborative efforts to reduce or end homelessness. But whether that role is acknowledged by others working in government, homelessness response remains, in my opinion, up in the air. 
I think there are actions libraries can take to build wider understanding regarding the role they can play to show the benefits of collaboration through libraries and the opportunities that libraries offer to connect with communities. So with that in mind, for the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to draw on what I learned through a number of interviews with library workers and others during my Churchill Fellowship and discuss five key insights about how libraries can best respond to and contribute towards ending homelessness um, in their communities. And I should just note at this point that these observations are mine. They're influenced by what I've experienced and the people I've spoken to during my Churchill Fellowship and in other times before and after that, mainly in the United States and Australia. I'm also neither a librarian nor a social worker, so I assume that many of you are much more qualified in this space than me, and I realise it's quite likely that a number of you might have different experiences or thoughts regarding the points I raise. But that said, I'd love to talk more about this with you because, after all, this is for all of us a learning experience. So, number one. Acknowledge that libraries have a role in ending homelessness and that while library staff are not social workers, they do have a role to play. I know I promised you insights from around the world, but I'm actually going to start in Melbourne. And here's my former friend, my former colleague and my friend Anne-Marie, who runs the City of Melbourne Libraries. And uh, this is a photo from a story run by The Age at the start of our library social worker program a few years ago. And it features Craig, who was a longtime library patron as well. And I start with this insight about the role that libraries play, because it was something that I only recognised when I moved from, a home, from the homelessness team into libraries. As a council worker, I've often reflected on the fact that we're quite good at reaching out into the community to coordinate homelessness response, but we actually fail to recognise many of the things that our councils deliver that might have equal impact in this space. And back then, it was news to me that council staff outside of the homelessness team could be valuable allies in helping us to understand the strains felt by a community and also excellent sources for collecting data about local homelessness situations. And as I mentioned already, the light bulb moment for us was in realising that both the library and homelessness teams at our council were working with many of the same people. Um, in acknowledging that we all had a role in this response, we took an important first step. But just as important was all of us, library staff and management, defining what role everyone would play. And this was our experience in Melbourne. And I heard the same reflection in every other interview that I conducted. If we agree that responding to the needs of patrons who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness or presenting with other complex needs is within the scope of a library's offering, what's the role that library staff should play? I'm certain we all agree that librarians are not social workers. But in these times when the scope of what libraries deliver expands, staff do have a role in working with and supporting the diverse needs of customers. And this really needs to be uh, clearly articulated. Having a social work program or people trained or equipped to work with people with complex needs in the library provides great support, but I don't think it means that every single interaction must be referred to the specialist team. You know, a balance really needs to be found and that works best when it's negotiated and agreed, when staff know clearly what is expected of them and know what to do when presented with situations that's outside of their immediate knowledge or comfort zone. Every library I visited ran training for staff in a variety of areas like trauma-informed responses, de-escalation techniques and drug and alcohol awareness and saw it as a responsibility to equip and support their staff. And it's a balance. Successful programs invest time and effort into making sure that library social workers and library staff hold a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities, and also understand how they'll work together. They respect what each other brings to the picture and how they can complement each other's work. 
So my first reflection, councils should acknowledge the multiple areas where homelessness might be addressed with libraries being one of these and making a commitment to supporting and training staff for the best possible response. Now on to number two, pay attention to your social workers' skill set and do what you can to support their needs. So this is Mariel Sass, and she last year when I visited was a social worker at Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library. And when we met, she'd been there for about a year and told me about her work with Donald Taylor, who you can also see in the photo, who she helped fulfill a dream. And that was getting a job as a school crossing supervisor. Donald was 82 and he didn't know how to apply for the job that was advertised online. And Mariel helped him um, with an email address and helped him complete his job application. She then monitored replies and every time an update um, came, she'd give him a call. She helped him prepare for the interview and when he got hired in August, she helped him to complete everything else he needed to do um, to start his new job. And so Mariel is one of those people who's privileged to have a name that reflects her personality. She's absolutely full of sass. And from the time I spent with her, I could see that she has energy and enthusiasm and lots of ideas. She's driven and makes a difference and doesn't shy away from what she believes in. And we spoke about what it takes to be a successful library social worker. And what she told me reflected attributes that I'd seen and observed in other locations. So first of all, she's a, she's a people person. She's built good relationships and works closely with many partners internally and externally. She's well organized and she's created processes to provide guidance and standardized ways of working. She's dedicated to training and mentoring and she's been running training for library staff and providing them with one-on-one -on -one support that they need as well. And she would go out to bat. She made the case to pay interns and she set up incentives that would encourage them to stay on outside of term dates. And she's not shy in approaching customers and tailoring her work to meet their needs. And Mariel described herself to me as a generalist with a vision. I love that. And she said that a major contributor to her success was the support that she got from her manager who has experience and clout and supports her by opening doors and providing access to other parts of the organisation. So my second reflection is not everyone will be a successful library social worker. And as an, and as a, as an emerging profession here in Australia, it's really likely that you'll have to look at transferable skills and work with your social worker to settle into a library situation. And also don't forget the supervision. You need to set boundaries and make sure everyone's clear about what your library social worker will and won't do, and importantly, be there to support and open doors whenever needed. So number three is build your library's ability to harness partnerships. From the perspective of someone who's worked in government and the community sector for some years, I will say that when the penny dropped for me, it opened up many opportunities that I'd never even considered. Uh, this was something that was also clear in the libraries that I visited. Every one of them was doing a lot of work in partnership with a variety of organisations and some were seeing particularly good outcomes because they broke silos that other parts of government and services were finding difficult to crack. Um, I know in, from my experience in Australia, it's pretty similar here. And this is a superpower of libraries. Well, probably is. I think this ability to reach into communities and connect is something that libraries as safe and trusted locations can really contribute. And I reckon also that it's something every homelessness service needs to know. And so this is Jean, who you can see on the screen, who she, and she's the manager of health and human services at the Washington DC Public Library. The city government created her position about nine years ago following a consistent rise in homelessness and a growing number of people with multiple and complex needs accessing the system. And speaking to Jean, I learned that under her direction, the Washington DC library system has, accept, has adapted constantly and built good relationships with other parts of government. So they're linking in with homelessness and mental health services in ways 
that recognise and capitalise on the important role that libraries can play as front-end community locations. As part of my fellowship, I ask colleagues in many different roles questions about how we can better connect with and involve the people who work with local work for local government who don't have homelessness in their job title or position description. And what I've heard is that this kind of connection between front end operations like libraries and homelessness services in the city might be widely recognized but not always enacted. In uh, many interviews, I've heard wide acknowledgement of the potential in this space, but seen little evidence of programs or formal partnerships in place with front end services. And I think li that library social worker programs are able to change things around, but still we need more work often to truly link those services together. Um, at the start, Jean's program in DC was funded through the Department of Behavioural Health, and this created a foundation that connected the library into a larger working system on mental health and homelessness. The library's program was connected into the housing system, and they took part in regular matching meetings, and the team was trained and had access to the city's homelessness management database. And this kind of connection was not only evident in DC. I heard about similar arrangements in the San Francisco library that saw the library recognized as an equal player in the city's response to homelessness. And it had a significant impact on the library's ability to assist customers experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, similarly, I recently had the opportunity to visit the Fremantle Library in, in Western Australia, where a local um, homelessness service and PATS has worked with the local council to establish a social work program. And it's an extremely strong partnership between those two groups that capitalises on what each can bring to the table. And it's making a huge difference in the local community. I mean, how they run it is a little bit different to how Melbourne runs it, but it's, um, you know, it's all, it's all interesting. It's important to look at being able to adapt as well. So my third reflection is strong partnerships and connections have made huge difference in places like Washington, D.C. and San Francisco and has taken those teams' work to the next level. A library social work program may work at one level to help manage individual transactions with customers, but through strong partnerships, the program can also bring about lasting change in communities. So it's much, it's much wider than just that local library um, that you're working in. So number four, don't be afraid to offer drug and alcohol support. So this is an interesting one because while I heard that responding to drug and alcohol use in and around their facilities was a factor that led to the establishment of social work responses in some libraries, Others might have difficulties rolling out programs that meet these community needs, either because of reluctance by management based on the perceived risks of doing so, or concern that initiating responses in this space might increase the numbers of people coming into libraries to receive assistance. I think these are really legitimate concerns, but I'd like to tell you about an incredible library worker I met in Baltimore, who through her work convinced me why libraries should be operating in this space. So here you can see Donna, and she's the peer recovery supervisor at the Pennsylvania Avenue branch of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And the library's located in one of the most notorious junctions in the city, the site of the 2015 riots following the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. And the police recovery program was initiated at the library in response to community need. There was, had been a spate of overdoses and a number of patrons presenting at the library with a variety of needs relating to substance use, homelessness, mental health, and domestic violence. Donna shared openly and with permission that her son experienced mental health and drug and alcohol addition, addictions and had died close to the library. Uh, she can see the spot from the window behind her. She said that this job had helped her heal. She'd have reflected that no one was around to help her son, but there are people here now if anyone needs. She now leads a group of trained peer recovery workers, people with a lived experience who are present, approachable and trusted by community 
and can provide one-on-one -on -one assistance in the library. And that peer worker program started in the library um, the year before last, and it's an extension of work undertaken in a number of public locations in Baltimore, including hospitals and courts. And importantly, it's linked to a uh, training system. That means that the people who participate actually get qualifications that they can then go and use in other places as well. The team there is trained and equipped to respond to a variety of needs, but actually one stands out. And as you can um, see in the photo here, um, there's a, a big focus on drug support, particularly the Narcan, which you can see on clear display on Donna's table. And she was quick to point out to me that the Narcan is out there and ready to use. So it's no, it, it's no accident that it's sitting there right in front of her. Um, one of the first questions she actually asked me when I met her was whether I'd been Narcan trained. And she told me about a recent situation where she administered four cans on someone and then did mouth to mouth. And he actually survived and came back to see her the next week to say thank you. So it's a really practical thing. Um, many local people know about the peer navigator program at the library that, and, um, you know, will, they'll often seek out the team there. And as I spent, I spent a, a good morning there with Donna. And as I sat at the desk with her, people just walked in and out asking questions or just dropping by for a chat. She was very much part of the, the furniture there. So my observation, um, this professional, clearly defined and open program embedded in the community is providing a much needed support service that helps people and creates extra goodwill with the library. It really ticked so many boxes. It was really quite amazing. Now, I know that Donna's story and experience certainly firms the point that I've put up on this slide. Number five is recognize the value of lived experience workers and know that everyone is different. So I'm just going to finish off with some reflections regarding why peer workers are such superstars in the library space. And uh, here's Leah Esquera and her lived experience workers, the Health and Safety Associates or HASAs at the San Francisco Public Library. In this picture, you can see uh, Leah, Ida, Sid and Jen. And the San Francisco's main library branch sits right at the intersection of the Civic and Tenderloin districts in San Francisco. And it's an area that's really well known for high levels of street homelessness. And Leah started up the library social work program about 15 years ago. And one of her first tasks after establishing the program was to hire lived experience workers. And actually in all that time, Leah is the only library, she's the only qualified social worker in the library. She hasn't, even though there are more than 20 branches of this library, she hasn't got a large team of qualified social workers. It's just her and a number of people with lived experience. The Haases um, started off initially as interns for six months to a year, working three hours a day, five days a week, and that would allow them the opportunity to also manage their own lives. And that part-time work pattern remains till now, and Leah said it's really important to allow the teams to achieve balance and manage other parts of their, their lives. And she commented that even before she knew the word trauma-informed, she was working on that model. Uh, Leah worked with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and they were the library's partner in the setup years of this program. And that initial affi affiliation lasted about eight years and their vocational counsellor helped connect people into the lived experience employment program. And the team had good connections with housing, homelessness, mental health and other services for clients. So actually having those really strong connections with other parts of government has been really key for this for this group. So um, Leah and her um, and the Haases are now direct um, employees of the library, which Leah is really pre pleased about. And the good news is that that brings higher wages and more stability for the lived experience team. The Haasa team's expanding. Um, they expanded recently from four to around six or to eight workers, and they work library opening hours seven days a week. And I had a wonderful conversation with Leah, Ida, Sid and Jen about this time last year when I was there and having, and, um, having got 
their permission to tell their stories, I thought I'd finish off by conveying a little about their work and their personal journeys, which, as you will hear, are all really very different. And I now understand that Sid's moved on to other things and Jen and Ida continue working at the library. And I know this will emphasise my last observation about recognising the huge value of lived experience workers in library context and noting that every person's experience is different. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't seen a lived experience program sort of up and running in a library here in Australia, but it'd be a lovely thing to see happening in the future. If you take a look at my report, you can read the stories of these peer workers from the San Francisco Public Library. Um, this is Jen first off on the left-hand side. And while at one time Jen had a good career in IT and working in the airline industry, long-term trauma turned to addictions and Jen hadn't held a job for about eight years. So to get on her feet, uh, again, her vocational manager recommended the Library's Health and Safety Associates Program. And this is Jen's story, and I'll tell it to you in her words. Right away, it was wonderful. I was immediately immersed with Leah, who was very qualified and compassionate. Because it is a lived experience role, it's a lot to take in. It's important having the supervisor, someone who can keep you grounded, keep the guardrails on. Leah gave us so many trainings. I gained insight. I'd never learned about boundaries and self-care. In this job, we walk all of the six floors of the library. We look for anyone who might be in distress or in need. The first thing I noticed was that in this job, you're able to sit with someone and talk to them. One person I was talking to was just so tired. We spoke and I thanked him for being so brave. He said, no one has ever told me I'm strong or brave. I told him, I experienced this too. We all have issues. In the past, I thought it was just me being toxic or dysfunctional. This job helped me realise I had something to offer and gave me a lot of hope. Society has a lot of labels. I had a lot of chaos in my own head. I thought I'd never get another job that someone would, or that someone would hire me being able to help someone really did a lot for me. Sid is in the middle and um, Sid came to the library about five years ago and left, I believe, earlier um, this, this year. He started at the library around the same time as Jen. He was introduced by Gina, a street medicine nurse, and the street nurses were a partner with the library. Um, she, she, Sid shared his story openly and in, in quick fire, which was the way he spoke. I had a waste away of a mother, no dad. I was on the streets by 12, drunk by 15, heroin addict by 20. I did that for a good eight or nine years. I'm not good at years, but I think I had 10 years of no cigarettes last month. And I think I've been 18 years sober. Back then, the nurse, Gina, who helped me get this job, here had openings for a methadone program. They looked for me on the streets for 30 days and got me into that program. That saved my life. I went into rehab, then I got a job here. Some people can't see that the world is not done with them. You can come back, but you have to want it. I wanted a job. I wasn't doing anything sitting in my house reading. I wanted to do something humble and to help someone. There's a certain joy in getting out of of getting someone to smile, to get a better day. I tell people I'm not a qualified counsellor, but they can just come here and talk to vent or bitch. I can offer that. I can take it. It's not a big deal. I know that our houses have become an inspiration for many of our patrons. I see a number of people from the old days and they see me and they're shocked. I think of libraries as the palaces of the cities. They need to be treated that way. And finally, that's Ida on the right. Ida sits at the far corner of the table. She's tiny with a black bob and tinted glasses. She looks like a librarian. She had been homeless and on drugs and alcohol most of her life, she says, and can relate. I was broken. I was lost and homeless and I looked like this so no one knew. Homelessness has many faces. You learn that too as you work in the library. I talked to anyone and everyone here. I never knew I could have such outgoing conversations. 
I was an isolated person before. I think that this job is important to the library. I think our lived experience has such an impact on lives because often there's no one else who is going to connect in this way. You know what it's like to be kicked around and rejected. If someone would just listen to you, you might have a chance. I think we change lives here. I asked, do you need help with anything? Do you need food? That is my opening. And then I'll start engaging with that person and ask about them. Some part times people just don't want services. They like their situation. I will be there to listen, to give hope. I will share my testimony. I was like this once. Now I work and I have a home. If you want it, we have the resources. This is what I did and I know it works. If you follow this, it might work for you. My observation, well, I don't think I need to say much more. Um, mainly my observation is recognise the value of lived experience and know that everyone's different. If you don't go down this path, invest in an authentic lived experience program that provides training and skill building opportunities and respects the individual needs of your workers. So here's a recap of my observations. Can libraries end homelessness? Maybe not alone, but I definitely think that if you're part of a team, you can make a difference. And that's it. I'll stop and I'll thank you for taking time to hear about my report. I'd love to answer some questions and to hear from you and hear a few ways to get in touch as well. I'll just leave it for a second there and uh, then I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, everyone. Glad we got through that. Yeah, just that little hiccup. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. And yeah, oh, I love the the cover of the um, report. Very cool. Um, and we do we do have time for questions. So Jenny had asked a question, and Jenny's at the Wagga Library in on Wiradjuri Country. And she asked if you're aware of any regional councils that have successfully built a library social worker model to work on homelessness issues, either Australia or overseas. So focusing on regional areas. Thank you. Um, I actually think that Wagga is a really good example of, of doing that work in a, in a regional area. I don't think there's any reason why regional areas shouldn't be able to, to do it. And what we do know is that um, a growing number of regional and rural areas are, are seeing um, rapid growth in homelessness. So it's probably a really uh, good opportunity to, to do that. So most of the places I know are um, in a city. That's not to say that in, um, in the United States, there probably are some very small places that are also doing it, but it goes down really to the fundamentals of, of, of doing the work. So the ability to sort of bring somebody in who can work with staff, who can support them, who can connect with patrons. And I don't think there's any real difference between doing that in a, you know, in a city or in a regional or rural area. So it'd be wonderful to see more programs happening all, all around Australia and also just doing it in a way that's, um, you know, that suits the place. Like you don't have to have, there isn't just one way to, to do this work. You can, um, you know, like in Wagga, you can look at bringing in, um, you know, interns and working through your university to do a um, to do the program in places like, you know, like in Fremantle or in in Melbourne, they've employed professional social workers. There are, there are many different ways of doing it, and it would also be wonderful to see some more lived experience happening. You know, lived experience workers coming in as well. Thanks for that, Leanne. Um, feel free to pop your questions into the chat or the Q and A. Um, yeah, I was interested in the the role of the lived experience workers, and um, yeah, I mean, you talked quite a bit about the the people, but how does it? What would kind of that job description look like? I guess. Yeah, so we did we did go through that quite a bit with um with Leah, and um, as she mentioned. You know, it's really about thinking about the past trauma that people have experienced as well. So it might not necessarily be like other, the job description might be quite different to other staff who you're working with. 
And it's really important to take into consideration um, how you can really properly support people, particularly with different sort of exp life experiences coming into the into the library. One of the interesting things that I heard from Leah was um, what she did was so staff only worked about three hour shifts. They didn't work full time because she uh, believed that you know, they needed other time to do other things in their life. But what she did at the beginning and end of every shift was that she would connect in with the lived experience workers. So she would connect in, check in with people before they started working, understand how they were that day, talk a little bit about what they did. And then at the end of the shift, always end with another meeting before everybody leaves to check in on what happened because sometimes work could be quite traumatic. So, and also just to make sure that people don't take that home with them. So it was really two bookends and that um, idea that you support people and make sure that they are very, you know, that they are able to, you know, sort of step out of that library and get on with their lives and not take with them what they've, what they've seen and done that day. And that was where she had said, you know, she had done that for some time. It was trauma-informed before she actually understood what trauma-informed might be. Okay. Thanks for that, Leanne. And Darcy has a question. How did the various library services go about the process of locating and hiring their lived experience workers? Did they seek out specific people or groups or find a way to advertise the roles without being reliant on technology and spaces that many may not have been able to access? Yeah, so that was a little different depending on the location. Um, and what we were able to, uh, in places like Baltimore, it was in uh, connection with a, uh, a training organisation that actually trained people and people gained qualifications. So it was through that, that agency, um, through places like the, I understand at the uh, San Francisco, they worked with, um, with other uh, social workers who were able to then connect people through programs. So it is a very sort of organised uh, way of connecting in with people and bringing people in and uh, training them as well so that they're actually equipped to be able to do the job. Thank you, Leanne. It's been very um, eye-opening for me regarding lived experience workers, so something, uh, you know, we can learn from and uh, perhaps um, trial it and, you know, have some initiative in that space uh, in collaboration with the uh, public libraries. So, so thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Leanne, we are about it at our time, our hour. <laughs> um, and yes, like with our other um, presentations in this series, they have been recorded and will be posted just at this QR code, which I had also popped into the chat earlier. So um, yes, I think with that, I'd just like to thank you so much, Leanne, for sharing your work and your time with us. Um, this was our last lecture of the year in the series, but we hope to have some more next year. So be watching um, for those those dates and times. Um, and yes, again, everything is has been posted on the um, at the QR here, the QR code here, in addition to Leanne's um, report. So thanks so much, Leanne. Thanks everyone for coming. And yes, have a great um, great rest of your Thursday. <laughs> or Wednesday or where, wherever you're coming to us from. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, everyone, for coming.